Okay, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Um, we're starting a new course tonight in our adult classes, and I call this Orthodox Survival Course. And of course, I'm not, well, I shouldn't say of course, because actually physical survival is a big question nowadays. But I'm not talking about our physical survival, although that is another question, the physical survival of actual Orthodox people and Orthodox cultures. But uh, primarily I'm talking about our spiritual survival, right? And often our physical survival do is the outcome of, a, of our spiritual survival. Although not always, because our, our spiritual stance may lead to actual to martyrdom, right? So in the case of the martyrs, their, their spiritual survival led to their physical physically being killed. But in the case of many people, their spiritual survival, that is their spiritual strength, kept them alive, enabled them to go on, enabled them to establish families, to establish communities, to to pass on their, their faith to their children, and so forth. So our purpose is to survive as Orthodox Christians, to remain in the church. And our purpose in our course is what I'm calling an orthodox philosophy of history, a way to understand our life today in light of what's gone before us. Because there's a concerted effort now to wipe out people's historical memory or to distort history so that you don't know where you came from and therefore you don't know where you're going. And then, so people who don't know their history and don't know the truth of where they came from can easily be manipulated People with no sense of history, no sense of who they are, have no roots, have no identity, can be manipulated. And that's true of our, of our faith. The faith is the primary place we get our identity from. And if, if we have to understand the history of our church and the, hi the history of, then of the world we live in as it's interacted with the church, and this will enable us to understand our situation today, what's the situation we're living in, and then, and which gives us strength to make good choices, to make to set our priorities correctly. Okay. So, our acquiring and in, to re, reading my notes here, our acquiring and then interiorizing that is putting inside of ourselves, making our own. Right? The church's view of history is critical because only those who understand the past can understand the present and deal with it effectively. So, when evil people destroy our history or they rewrite our history, right? that enables them to, to deceive us, to control us. And so by understanding our current situation better, we can acquire interior peace. So the first, the first result of understanding, say if you're in a crisis situation, you're in a disaster situation, you're in a trouble situation, you don't know what to do next. Now the first step is to understand the nature of your situation. You haven't fixed it yet. Right? You haven't made any choices yet. But just knowing what's going on, just n honestly knowing the situation and assessing it all and seeing it is you already acquire peace, you acquire stability. You know the truth. Our Lord said, know the truth and truth will set you free. So even when people are suffering a great deal, if they know the truth, it gives them deep inner peace, right? That that can't be taken away from them. And that's why the enemies of the church and the enemies of, of ourselves, right, are always trying to quash, quash the truth. They could have control over 98% of the discourse in the public. One little person says the truth, and they go into overdrive, trying to, no, no, shut them up and put them in jail and kill them and, and tell, say they're crazy and so forth, because the truth is very powerful, and truth can give us peace. Okay. Another th reason, we, another reason we, should, we, we need to think with the mind of the church to understand history is that alone, of all so-called world religions, the Christian faith is a faith of history. Now, this is hard for us to understand, living in the modern world, studying history in school, everybody goes studies history in university and so forth. It's hard for us to realize that at one time, there was no science of history. At one time, there are very few historical writings. And the whole science of history, the whole understanding that we live in a history, that, that we started at point A and we went to point B and we go to point C and that we're, we're going on a trajectory from one time to another is a specifically Christian idea. Because all the other, remember, all people's concept of the world comes from their faith, from their religion. So the great oriental religions, or the Buddhism or Hinduism, or the ancient classical view, as we find in ancient paganism, or in, say, the ancient philosophy, say, of Plato, is that life is cyclical, just goes in a circle. 
everything is more or less the same. All the, It just goes to the same cycle and it just the same stuff happens over and over again. Right? And it was the revelation coming from the Old and New Testaments and in the church that transformed mankind's vision into one of linear history. And, and also that God, and very importantly, so there's linear history, and secondly, that God intervenes in history and does things in history. He's not a distant God who's just in another world and has nothing to do with us. See, Whereas this world is real. In Hinduism and Buddhism, right, the world, this world isn't real, it's illusion. Right? And you're liberated by realizing nothing here is real. And you, you get rid of all your karma through reincarnations and eventually you just go to nirvana. Right? Your soul is absorbed into the world's soul and, and that's it. Right? But in the scriptures, God reveals that he's very interested in our history, that this world is real. It's not the most real world. The most real world is the next world, right? It's, it's the kingdom of heaven. But this world is definitely real. Our bodies are real and our bodies are part of who we are. We don't change our bodies for another body. This is it. And we only have one life to live. And that life is going to be judged by God. And we're going to be placed in paradise or in hell for eternity. So this, suddenly this life, both my individual history as a human being, and then the history of the whole human race becomes something intensely important. Goes from, be goes from being unimportant and an illusion to being very, very important. And God, all, God sh showed how important this world is by revealing to Moses that he created it. Out of nothing. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This is a revelation to mankind. People hadn't thought of that before. They thought this world was just all there is and just goes around around circles. And then you realize it's an illusion and you just go to, you just leave it and you go, you get absorbed or you just die. Okay. But that God created this world and it's real. And, that, and then that, that he comes into the world and he talks to human beings. He talks to mankind. He chooses people to be his, ser his friends, his servants. Finally, that he becomes a human being. He becomes a human being. It's the ultimate intrusion of God into history. He actually enters history as a man. And then he doesn't just leave behind, Jesus Christ doesn't just leave behind a philosophy or a, uh, a morality or a teaching. Or, you know, there are plenty of philosophies and moralities and teachings. Jesus Christ left behind a visible body of people called the church, whom, whom he calls his body. Or in another place, the Holy Fathers say the kingdom of God on earth is the church, not some glorious kingdom right, that's going to dominate everybody, but the church, that this is the kingdom of God on earth. And that, and that the, this church is here in history to affect history, to affect people, to convert them to this faith. And this church, in the course of history, this church created whole nations and directed and, and profoundly affected the entire course of history. And it's looking forward to the end of history. And it's, history, history is going to have an end. It doesn't go around in circles. It ha, it's a line and it has an end. And at, at the end, Christ is going to come again to judge the living and the dead. So the, the, entire, the church's entire vision of reality is historical. And so it's very important for Christians to understand the history of the, the history of the world, the history of the church, but specifically to acquire an orthodox orthodox eyes, an orthodox filter to see all this. Okay? We all have access, we have more access to information now than any point in history. You can ask Mr. Constantine who's constantly sending me books. <laughs> Hundreds of books, right? have thousands of books. We have so many books. We have books in general and more orthodox books now than, than available to us at any time in history. Mm -hmm. So the, all the information is out there. I can't possibly teach our little course here and give you all the, all, give you all the information that you could possibly learn about history or civilizational history or orthodox or church history. The purpose of our course is to go through history in a very specific way to interpret it from the church's point of view, to, for us to acquire orthodox eyes and a way of understanding what's gone before us. And so that in future, when we read books of history, which could be written by, from an atheist point of view, from a communist point of view, from 
all kinds of points of views, right? We can look we can look in the book or listen to the audio or look at the video and say, well, I hear the data that he, this person's quoting, but his interpretation is not right, right? It's not from the church. It's not from God. That the church's interpretation of that event or that person would be this. Right? So we, we need to acquire these orthodox eyes and orthodox understanding to filter history, to understand it. So to see it as a coherent whole, we can be overwhelmed by the just the vast amount of data that we're given about things past and things going on in the present. Right? So now it is really overwhelming. We have information overload, but it's fragmented. Right? This information is fragmented. It just comes to us in bits and pieces, and then people can manipulate it and can present it to us any way they want. And we can, and, and uh, uh, I don't know about you, but I think a, uh, an experience of many contemporary people is that the more information they get, the more and more confused they are. That a mark of the contemporary psyche is that people are extremely confused. And, and that's why so many people are so angry, or so many people feel so helpless, right? Because they're confused. They don't know what to make of what they hear or what they see. So they're more and more frustrated. They just retreat into themselves, retreat into video games, retreat into sports games, retreat into drink, drugs, retreat into just depression, right? Because they can't um, integrate and understand. Because God made us to understand the world around us and to have a place in it and to see the meaning of our lives. Every human being that we know deep down whether we're baptized or even unbaptized people, right? Christians or heathens. The human, the human spirit, deep down, every human being knows that his life is supposed to have meaning. And that life is supposed to be coherent. But, but people today are, 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 are being constantly convinced that life is meaningless and that it's fragmented. They're just fragments of reality. And they're just trying to get through the day with... Uh, a minimum of disturbance or with the most pleasure possible or just just without falling into depression or, or becoming maniacal or whatever their their temptation is you see so but as orthodox christians we're very blessed because god's given us the truth right and given us the 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 truth of faith that not only affects our interior life or the way we pray or the way we worship but also gives us a vision of where the entire meaning of our life our lives as individual people, our lives as family, as a parish, as a community, our, our life as a civilization. And because Christianity, or rather, excuse me, the church is not simply this body of Christ, the church. The church can also be understood in a broader sense as an institution that, in a, that very significantly, in, in many ways, can be said to have created the civilization that we live in. At least all the good aspects of it. See? And it's this entire civilization, the, the entire order of things that's under attack now and that's being destroyed and that's being broken up and remade into a very inhuman or even post-human form. Right? But if we're securely in the church and we have the church's eyes to see all of this, even though bad things are going on, even though we may not have all the answers to, to, to what to do to solve all of our outward problems, Inwardly, we have stability and peace because we understand where we're coming from, where we're going, what's going on, and what our ultimate destiny is, and that God is in charge, that God is the king of the ages. God is the creator of time. He's the creator of men. He's the creator of history. That even when bad things happen, they cannot escape the sovereignty of God, and that God desires our salvation, and that we will not, if we don't want to be lost, we will not be lost. But we have to make efforts, and, and uh, this class is part of those part of that efforts. Now, um, the second um, topic here is that I want to mention that our, this course is a follow-up to something we did several years ago. We read a book by a man named Richard Weaver called "Ideas Have Consequences," and that that's that that is a great book. It's an extraordinary book. It's an extraordinary book. If you, you can send it to you if you want to. Yeah, and I also have a link there to the PDF here. Yeah. That, I think you scanned it, yeah. but then that somebody else has put it online. There's a link here to a, yeah. And the book itself is only 
$2, oh yeah, you can get. Everyone is selling. It. You can go on. You can, you can go online and get very very good used copies, very cheap used copies of the book. Um, now, what is ideas? I'm going to mention ideas of consequences because, in some ways, this class is a follow up to complete that study we made of ideas of consequences. Because remember, ideas of consequences is a wonderful book, but Weaver's perspective is limited. Why? Because he's a Western Christian. He was a practicing Anglican. Actually, he was kind of an agnostic or a skeptic, as many intellectuals of that generation were. And then as, he's, as he went through his intellectual life, he's actually an English professor. He's a professor, professor of literature and rhetoric at the University of Chicago. Um, and your classes and your yes, I have the I have the MP3s of those classes. I need to share them. I was just expressing before class how I have to fear the technology because those files are too big to send as email attachments. Um, so upload them to a cloud or a some kind of a service. Some, some. Yeah, we'll work on that. But we need to we need to we need to revisit or that a, book. Or a CD. Yeah, we need to revisit or put it or just burn a CD. Yeah, we need to revisit that book. But who is Richard Weaver was a professor at the University of Chicago. Um, he died relatively young, in, around age 60, or in, the, in his 50s, yes. But he wrote this beautiful book, very powerful book, called Ideas of Consequences, which traces the degeneration of Western thought and culture since the rise of nominalism, which is a type of philosophy, in the 14th century, the 1300s. So his point is, like many Western Christians who are traditional, he says the church, being the Western church, the Roman church, reached its apex in the 13th century, in the 1200s, and that was a great synthesis of Western culture. Then since then, even though there have been great advances in technology, or great advances in ma the material progress of European culture, there's been a tremendous decline in the spiritual quality of European culture into greater and greater materialism and greater and greater intellectual darkness to the point where we have now. What we ended up our culture, in, in some ways, the European culture was the greatest in history. Then in the 20th century, it commits suicide, world war, revolution, to the point where now the world is in a spiritual and, and in some ways a social and political chaos. How did this happen? Where did it come from? And he's, he's writing in 1948. Yeah. Um, and he's already, he's already seeing the, what people call the, would call the death of Western culture, the, the death of European culture. He says, well, how did this happen? So he's tracing... He traces this from, he believes it's from, in the beginning of the 14th century, at the very beginning of the dawn of the Renaissance, where they rejected the, the, the elite started rejecting the, 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 the synthesis of Western Christianity in the 13th century, the time, of, the time of Thomas Aquinas and the great Gothic cathedrals and uh, this image of the, the high medieval Western church, right, that we have. Um, and I've all, I often said, as we were going through this book, I said, you know, we need to write an orthodox preface or an orthodox companion or orthodox footnotes or edition of Ideas of Consequences because Weaver didn't go far back enough. The problem is when the Western Church separated from orthodoxy. And they reached for a brief time, they did have a brilliant high point Right after they left Orthodoxy, they, had, they reached this brilliant high point in their, in their outward culture, right? And the, a brief high point in their church's dominance of their society. Okay. But then it went into a tailspin. The 14th century was disastrous in many, many ways for Western Europe. But after that point, it, it just went into a tailspin. Every, with every century, it becomes more and more unraveled, and their philosophy becomes more and more uh, hopeless, and fragmented to the point where in the 19th century, finally, at the end of the 19th century, we have Nietzsche announcing the death of God. Nihilism, nothingism. And the whole philosophy now that's dominating the universities, that's dominating political discourse, and dominating cultural discourse, is nihilism. Is nihilism. But that didn't come out of nowhere. It came out as a result of centuries of a degeneration. And Weaver talks about this, but Weaver doesn't go back far enough. And I, I remember, I don't know if you remember this, when we were going through the book, I was often saying, we need to write an orthodox chapter to this, or a whole orthodox companion to this. So the, 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 the breaking, the, the point where things began to degenerate was the Western Church's departure from orthodoxy in the 9th to the 11th centuries. In the 9th century is the time of the schism between uh, Pope Nicholas of Rome and St. Photius, 
the, the so-called, the Westerns called the Phocian schism. We called the Nicholas schism, but that schism, all right. Then it was patched up for a little while. Then 200 years later, there's more of a final break. And then, of course, the time of the Crusades, the sack of Constantinople, uh, hardened the division. And then in the 14th century, we have uh, we're the last great theological controversy in the East. And, and um, where certain people took side with the Latins against St. Gregory Palamas about the essence and the energies of God. And we're going to talk about that. That's a very deep theological topic, but it actually has a very important practical impact on us. Okay? And so the, the, the West's rejection of the teaching of St. Gregory Palamas, the teaching of the church about prayer and about the theosis and the energies of God really sealed or ended the West's possibility of returning to orthodoxy. And then the Council of Florence, when the, the true Orthodox, led by St. Mark of Ephesus, rejected union with the Rome, finally, really, that was the end. The, the, that really put the official seal on this schism. And uh, Orthodoxy remained the same, and the West kept changing. And part of our course is going to be, a big part of our course is going to see how it kept changing to end up to where we are today. Now, I was inspired to, to call this course Orthodox Survival Course by a friend of ours, Father Seraphim Rose, whose books we've read before, and uh, who's a, a very, a very helpful writer. The, this American convert to Orthodoxy is born in the 1930s. He's basically my mother's generation, people born in the 1930s. And um, he, he was, he'd been about my, my mother's age if he were alive today. Uh, he died relatively young. Uh, in, in 1982, I believe he was only a, he was born in 1934, so uh, that made him, what, uh, 48 when he, when he passed away. Um, he wrote a bunch of uh, very helpful articles, uh, well, many, many articles, and, and few but very important books. This uh, binder here has a printout of a series, his notes of a series of lectures that he did. Actually, this is a this is really a transcription. Uh, well, I have to look this. I don't know if these are his notes or if this is an, a transcription of the audio of his lectures. In the 1970s, he wasn't even a, a priest yet. He was ordained a priest in the late 70s. So this is a, this is from the mid 70s. One note I said said 19, 1975. And up in the monastery in Platina in California, they would have these pilgrimages where people would come and they do they it'd be during the summer. They'd go outdoors and sit up outdoors and have classes under the trees. And he would. He would teach them, and they'd record his, his lectures on uh, cassette, cassette recorders. And he called this Orthodox Survival Course. Um, and this, this, these notes, I found these notes online, and this really inspired me to put together this course. So with gratitude and giving him the credit, we'll call our course also Orthodox Survival Course, but updated to 2017. So I'm going to draw a lot from Father Seraphim's, uh, these unpublished notes, and I'm going to refer to the sources that he quotes. Um, these are unpublished notes. I don't know if the St. Herman Press ever plans to put this together into a book. Um, but again, I'm not selling this, and I'm not, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm not, we're not stealing this, right? These are unpublished notes that are available and that this is helpful to us, right? This, this is not copyrighted material that we're pirating somehow. Um, but a major difference between Father Seraphim's lectures and our classes will be this. Father Seraphim assumes that the listener understands more or less what orthodoxy is, what orthodox culture is, and he, that, they underst that the listener understands the first millennium. This is what the church was like from zero to 1,000. This is what the church was like. So he, he takes that for granted. His course starts with when the West left orthodoxy. Okay. But I, I, with this course, I'm going to go back to the early church because we want, we want to understand the church's entire vision of her own history. We're going to go back to the early church and talk about the early church, the church of the martyrs, and then the church of the, after the legalization of Christianity by St. Constantine, the entire period, period from the St. Constantine to the schism with Rome. And understand the mind of the church about that era of history, what it means, the meaning of that era of history. And as and the, the rise of monasticism, for example, and the development of the church's spiritual literature, and how the church understood what church life is, and therefore what human life is, and what society is, in the first millennium, that East and West shared. I mean, there were heretics who went off 
like the the Arians and Nestorians and Monophysites. Right? But there was this huge right, united imperial Catholic Church, Catholic with a small c, meaning the Orthodox are the the, the Orthodox, right? that had a unified vision and a unified uh, picture of life and of history and, and what church life was, what human life was, what the meaning of history is. The church had a unified vision. And still, the, true, the Orthodox Church still has a unified vision. But the West developed a different vision and they broke with the church. And that break with the church is the fatal moment that created the entire dynamic, the entire mechanism of degeneration that, that is still bearing f bitter fruit today. So we're going to start with the first thousand years, understand the early church and the, the church of, of uh, the Constantinian era leading up to 1000, and then we're going to talk about the, how the West broke with orthodoxy and how this affected everything else. Okay. So our goal is to focus on the meaning and the overall character of each period. We, I, I can't, I'm not going to deluge you with, again, with information, with a lot of data and facts. The, this happened, the, I, of course, I'll have to refer to historical events. We're constantly going to be referring to historical people and historical events. But the focus of our gatherings, and I really prefer to call them gatherings rather than classes. I'm not, not up just showing a PowerPoint presentation and just giving you a test at the end. Right? These are really gatherings where as brothers and sisters in Christ, we're, we're struggling together to arrive at this unified vision, to be, to be energized, to be, to be restored by this, and to go forth and, and to, to put our, let our vision be a foundation for our action in our lives. Okay. So this is really what is called, what I'm attempting to hear in a smaller, humble way, um, is a meta-history. Meta-history means an approach to history which integrates all of the data involved in a vision, a unified vision of a, a whole, the whole, of the whole panorama of this history and what it means. So that we, f we and then we interiorize this and it becomes part of our filter for seeing the world. There are there are great meta historians in history. Actually, in in the ancient historians. We're all meta-historians. Now, the ancient historians, starting with Herodotus, um, the, the, the great Greek historians, Herodotus, Thucydides, and then later uh, Polybius, uh, with, the, with the, the Romans, Polybius, Polybius Tacitus, and so forth. Um, all these historians, then later Orthodox historians, uh, first of all, of course, the great Eusebius of Caesarea, his history of the early church. And then later Orthodox historians, they're all, in a sense, meta-historians, and that they're not just, they didn't see themselves as just collectors of data. They, they, they really saw God's hand in history. Even these ancient pagans, you know, we saw the hands of the gods, or the hands of fate from their point of view right, in history, and how fate or the gods used the Greeks to conquer the Persians, or used the Romans to conquer the Phoenicians, uh, Carthage, and so forth. And then with the, the church historians seeing the hand of God in history, and this is the standard way of thinking of history because people always, uh, un until the modern era and this, this so-called scientism where people became obsessed with just data and quantifying data and having all these pseudo hard science analyses that they have in the social sciences. And uh, it, they should say social and then sciences in quotes, right? Because it's, it's, they're, they're trying, today they try to import uh, the hard methods of physics, mathematics, chemistry, and engineering into history, into literature, into psychology, which of course is inappropriate. Because right? the purpose of studying history is not to perform quantitative or mathematical analyses, although in, that may be useful sometimes as a tool. But the point is to understand our place in life. What is our relation to our own, to our own past? What is our relation to God? Okay? So, so in a sense, we're doing a meta-history tying all of these factors together or the things that we learn together into one coherent tapestry of understanding, an integrated understanding of where we come from and our present situation. Okay. So we have the rest of our lives to read various books. We, I, we can't sit here and read all the books we need to read. Okay. But our course time will be spent in deepening our understanding, giving us the tools or the filter, the vision, the eyes to read whatever comes our way.
whatever books come our way or whatever websites, videos, audios, information comes our way. It's called discernment. Part discernment. Yes. Discretion, discernment. Having the tool to sift the wheat from the chaff. And do it and do it from the Orthodox do it from the church's point of view, of what God has given us. Or the, God has given us minds, and God has given us grace and holy baptism, and God has given us the church's guidance to interpret what's going on around us. But it's very hard, especially for young people. Mm. Well, it's because, taken from because them. Because there is so much, so many lies, and yeah. semi-lies, and semi truth Yeah, the semi-lies are the worst ones. Because mm -hmm. yeah. a total lie... Mm -hmm. You say, well, that's that's obviously it's something that's totally bad. You know, obviously, you know, so if you hand someone rat poison, say, have some rat poison, they're not going to eat it. But if you hand the rat poison and say, this is candy, well, of course, you know, they're much more likely to much more likely to take it if they don't can't discern uh, candy from rat poison or rat poison from candy. Uh, so acquiring discernment, yes, discernment, the ability to to tell truth from falsehood. And it's not only an intellectual, there is an intellectual training that has to happen. We have to have the actual information. We have to have the tools to analyze the information. But we also have to be praying, and we have to be working on ourselves morally. Right? We have to be, use the church's tools of prayer, of confession, of fasting, of, and the, the holy mysteries, holy communion, uh, drinking holy water. All these, all these tools the church gives us to, to overcome our passions and sins, to acquire pure souls, and when you have a pure soul, you have a pure mind, and you're less likely to be fooled. You become more humble. You become, and a humble person sees reality. Right? The more vain you are, the less you're in touch with reality. But the more humble you are, and a hum what is a humble person? A humble person sees himself as he is, and he sees life around. Therefore, he can see life around him as it really is, without having to pretend something, put on something, imagine emotionally or romantically it's some other thing and it's not what it actually is okay. um, so that's yes discernment is a good word to to encapsulate all of that okay. and it should inspire us to take action to live in a certain way that's the point all of our learning all of our classes we've always done here have never been just out of vital curiosity or or because we're getting a degree in theology or something like that it's to help us take action to help us live in a certain way and it really is the eleventh hour. As Father Seraphim Rosie says, it's later than we think. It's it's urgent that we understand these things. It's urgent that we share this with others, and uh, because we do this out of love, even especially when we have to tell people things they don't want to hear. Well, you you know you really love somebody when you tell them something for their own good, and you know they're going to punch you in the nose. I mean, that's really when you love somebody if you're able to tell them that, the thing that they don't want to hear. Um, and so we have to we have to love people enough. Um, to tell them the truth. And we have to examine our own priorities, how we spend our time, uh, so we can spend the rest of the rest, the time of our life is so precious. When we have, and now, when I reached my 60th birthday last month, I realized it hits home, you know, the, these decades, you know, it hits home, you know, the time of my life is really precious. You know, my father died when he was 71. <clears throat> so by, by that measure, I have 11 years to live. You know, if I died when my father did, I mean, God knows, but, I would have 11 years to live. So what are you going to do with, those, with that time? So we have to realize the time of our life is precious. It's this precious treasure given us by God. And he wants us, us to spend it for our salvation and out, of, and out of love for other people, especially the people we're responsible for, our family. In my case, I'm a priest, so it's my family. It's my parish. It's my brother Christians who come here. Okay, that's my primary responsibility. It's not for you know, Timbuktu or Tasmania or you know, the multitudes out there, it's the people right around us. And we have to think of how we're going to use that time for our own, the people that God has given us, who we are, and to help them find their salvation. So that's, that's the purpose. Now, now, I've talked about these two sources, the survival course notes, these notes right here are at this, at this um, URL here, uh, at scrib.com. And Ideas of Consequences is at this other website. So uh, I encourage everyone to read this. The notes really are just notes. Or are there the transcription of an audio? I'm not sure. Um, but they are, therefore, this is not a polished book. Right? There are places where it, it just breaks up. 
or there's just a parenthesis with dot, dot, dot. And it's not grammatically perfect because Father Seraphim is pausing, he's making little asides, he's saying, uh, he's, he's saying, saying ungrammatical things the way, the, the way I'm speaking right now, right, in, in an informal or extemporaneous talk. Um, but you can, but it's, you can certainly make sense of it. It's, it's very tomorrow, 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 tomorrow it's his day. Oh, he passed, he passed away on September, September 2nd. 2nd. That's right. Tomorrow the Feast of the Prophet Samuel. That's right. I'd forgotten that. Eternal memory to him. Yeah. Eternal memory. That's right. Tomorrow's the anniversary of his repose. 82. So that would have been, uh, that's 35 years ago. It's hard to believe. I became Orthodox the year after he passed away. But I've been reading his things. I've been getting Orthodox America. We used to have, we used to publish this little newspaper called Orthodox America. And he founded it in the uh, 1980, I think. It's called the Orthodox World. No, no, Orthodox Word is separate. Orthodox Word is a, the little journal published by the monastery, by St. Herman's. Orthodox America was a newspaper, is a newspaper format. And it was, and he, Father Seraphim and Father Herman, encouraged uh, Father Alexei Young, who was a married priest, and these two sisters, the Mansur sisters, Catherine Mary Mansur, who are these unmarried, kind of semi-monastic sisters, like pious ladies. They didn't become nuns, but they were, they were extremely pious. And, and, uh, and they started this newspaper. And I say we because in, in 87, I got involved with it because I moved to Denver. And I, Father Lexi Young was my, my uh, co-pastor for several years, from 87 to 89, and then 96 to 2000. We worked closely together. So I used to write, I wrote a few articles for Orthodox America. Um, but what was, I forgot why I, why I got onto that. Oh, oh, because well, Father Seraphim Rose, yes, he died in 82. And I'd already been reading Orthodox America, which was written by people that were around him, and he would write for it too. And then I heard that he passed away. And the next year I became Orthodox. Then very shortly, only a couple of years later, I became a priest. And then in 87, uh, I met Father Alexei, who had been very close to Father Seraphim. So... He spent a lot of time telling me stories about Father Seraphim, Latina, and so forth. So, um, so he certainly had an effect on our lives. Um, he's affected the lives of many people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's okay. very interesting that you, you didn't uh, realize that tomorrow it's his day and we started the curse today. I see, yeah, I, yeah. I just chanted the Vespers for Prophet Samuel. I, I'd totally forgotten. But I, as I was chanting the, the Oxasticon for the Dormition, I was remembering... I thought about him, and I remembered how much he loved the Dormition. That was like his favorite feast, and he died during the Dormition. Yeah. He's got the nihilism. The, the that book on nihilism is very good. Now, that book on nihilism is just one part of a proposed book he never wrote. He wrote a book called, uh, he proposed this monium opus called The Kingdom of God and Kingdom of Man or something like that, inspired by St. Augustine's The City of God, except it would be a modern, like a rewrite in a sense. Uh, and, tra and doing what Weaver did, doing what we're doing here, which is tracing this history, uh, how, how the West fell away from orthodoxy and, and the, the results of that for our lives, how that affected the, the whole course of civilization. And, and nihilism was the one part that he actually finished and that was published in book form. It's a finished book. It's a finished, it's a little book, but it's a very powerful book, a very important book. So we're going to get to nihilism. That's later on in our course. Toward the end of our course, we're going to talk about nihilism. Yes. But if you want to see nihilism, just look all around. If you want to hear nihilism, go into a university course. Go into a university course on Shakespeare or Plato and have the professor... How about Alan Bloom? Have you read about him? Yeah, The Closing of the American Mind. Yes, I'm reading it right now. Yeah, The Closing of the American Mind. It's a valuable book. It's a valuable book. Closing of the American Mind. It's about... And he's writing in the 80s. And that's about my age when I went to college. Yes. Yeah, he's talking about the 80s. And they, were already, they had already started deconstructing the whole canon of Western literature. The last, the, the last generation that got the old university education was really the, the generation that graduated in the 60s, mm -hmm. like right before my time. Already in my time, we were, we were already dealing with a very fragmented curriculum. So, for example, I went to Catholic seminary. So up to, my, up to my generation, like up to the men who taught me in their seminary training, they were given a very systematic, coherent training in philosophy. I was a philosophy major. And they all had studied, all the Catholic priests at that time were required to study philosophy. And it was all very coherent. 
Well, here's, here's what the, the ancient philosophers taught about ethics. Here's what they taught about science. Here's what they taught about various subjects. And they'd go through all the ancient philosophers and the church's view and the pagan view. And, and all these men were given a very, a very strong and a very systematic training to understand things from their Roman Catholic point of view. It wasn't orthodox, but at least it was coherent. And it was based on historical tradition. Right? But then by the time I got to the seminary, they just gave us a cafeteria. Oh, you want to study Hegel? You want to study Kant? You want to study uh, Plato? Yeah, go ahead. Just pick whatever you want. So we were just given this cafeteria, and we had no idea how to put it together. And, and if we tried to put it together, the professors would even laugh at us. Hmm. No, just study it for its own sake. Just study it just to read this author. See? Because they were actually, they, were, they, they, and the, the, they had been trained the old way, but they were the revolutionary generation. They rejected it. This book is talking about everything that aspect about it. Yeah. So I was actually taught by the first, in American academia, now perhaps in other places, obviously in communist countries, it happened right before, at the time of revolution. Much, much quicker. But, but in, in, in the States, it happened in the 60s. I was, so I, my generation was taught by the first completely revolutionary generation in academia. And they were men who were taught the old way. But now the kids are being taught by people who are taught the new way. So they have no, they have no mooring at all. Right? They're completely just uh, going to... They're, they're going, it's, it's a, um, it's a, it's a um, centrifugal movement. They're just going farther and farther out. Narrow, narrow, uh, right. field, and that's about all the education. You're locked in this... In everything else, you're like nobody. You're locked into this fragment. Now... Obviously, there's, there's, it's imp specialization is important in a technical field where you're trying to make a technical breakthrough of some kind. You have to specialize. Right? But before you do all the specialization, everyone should have common base. the common base. Because why? To have a shared culture, have a shared understanding, to have a society, right? P p for people to live together. Right? And that's what the kids are being denied that. They're just, they're just being taught a bunch of, they're, taught, they're being taught a lot about to hate everything, to hate their parents, their civilization, their culture, the church, to hate, you know, uh, their life. hate their life. <laughs> how bad, every, how bad everyone is, and that they just should, they just need to uh, give in and turn turn our country over to the Muslims, or, or just uh, I don't know, drug, sex, and rock and roll, or, or whatever, whatever they're being taught. Um, so yes, it's a, that the Bloom Bloom is a good book, um, and, and it's a good critique from. Uh, it's not complete, right? It's not the orthodox point of view. It's not a full Christian or orthodox point of view, but it's certainly a very good critique of what was being done at the universities at that time. And now it's way beyond what that. There's another. There's an interesting fellow. Again, he's not a Christian, but he's an interesting critic of what's called now postmodernism. His name is Jordan Peterson. He's a professor in Canada, and he he's so upset about this postmodernism that he got a friend of his to write an algorithm to create a, a computer program so that when kids are about to sign up for a course, they can look at the syllabus, they can feed the syllabus, scan the syllabus, send it into this computer, and the syllabus will look for keywords, the, the computer will look for keywords in the syllabus and tell the student, don't take that course, it's postmodernism. Because hmm. they have buzzwords, they have these keywords, mm -hmm. you know, multicultural, um, gender study, race affirm, you know. You just have to look at the index. You just have to look, well, you do, but some people, Need help, need help, right? So he's on a now. He's not a Christian. He is what what would be called a philosophy of Perennis person. He believes there's such a thing as universal human tradition. That um, Father Seraphim Rose talks about this. Father Seraphim part of part of Father Seraphim Rose's transition to Christianity was following a philosopher named Rene Guénon. And Rene Guénon was was of course nominally a Catholic, being a Frenchman, but he was actually a believer in the philosophy of Perennis, that there's this great universal tradition of the things that all the great cultures had in common and that there are authentic versions of Christianity, authentic versions of Buddhism, authentic versions of Hinduism and so forth, that there's a bedrock tradition. Of course, that uh, as a partial insight, that's true. Right? And there's a classical version of all the great cultures and they're also bastardized or degenerate or phony versions. And there's also occult religion. And Guénon always made a distinction between uh, acceptable or classical or genuine religion and occult religion, which is always, and occult religion is always dedicated to manipulating God, manipulating nature, manipulating other people. 
It's hidden. It's a cult because they, they know they're doing something bad. Right? And um, so, so Peterson is kind of a follower of this school of thought. So I don't recommend him as a spiritual guide, but he's an interesting, his, his critiques of postmodernism are, are very powerful. So you could say if you take a, a person who's not an Orthodox or not a Christian, but they know something's wrong with the university. And, and uh, you know, if you just tell them, well, read the Holy Fathers, they're not going to listen to you. But they say, well, at least listen to this man. At least they can start getting a little wisdom about what's wrong. And by, what do you mean by postmodernism? Postmodernism is the rejection of reason itself. Right? So mo in modernism, right, starting with the Enlightenment in the 18th century, and in many ways going back to the Renaissance period, people embraced human reason as, as this god that was going to solve all of our problems. Okay, so we just use reason, and that's the rise. And of course, that gave birth to the rise of modern science. Right? If we just use our brains and reason that we have reason, and of course, the 18th century uh, philosophers, the deists, believed that God gave us this reason. They didn't believe that God was Jesus Christ or the Trinity. But they did believe there was a God of some kind or a creator who gave us man reason, expected man to use reason to solve his problems. Right? So that's modernism. It's rejection of the tradition of the church and the authority of the church. Revelation, basically. It's rejecting revelation. Rejecting revelation, right? <clears throat> rejecting prayer and revelation and mystical life as a, the fount of truth and just focusing on reason. Right? That's modernism. But of course, that runs out of steam, right? Because it's limited. It's finite. It's not from God, right? It's finite. So it's bound to run out of steam. It's bound to exhaust itself. So in the great cataclysm of the 20th century, it exhausted itself, right? Reason didn't save us from world war and revolution and, and, and all the things that destroyed our, 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 our culture, our civilization, right? And so exhausted by reason now the postmodernists just reject reason and just have flown into unreason but what happens when you find unreason what's the only, what's the only motivation left for action power power this is nietzsche nietzsche was the prophet of this right so nietzsche died before world war one but nietzsche is the prophet of the of what's going to happen in the 20th century says so this whole project is dead you're doomed and there's just going to be, there's going to emerge the superman who just has, realizes that the, the purpose of life is the will to power. And you have to be, you have to rise above everyone else and become this superior being who's going to dominate other people. And um, so we have all, the, all the, the, the elite that rule the world today, right, who are pulling the levers, pushing the buttons behind the scenes. They're motivated, pardon me? The, 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 the plutocratic cryptocracy. The hidden, the the hidden, the hidden people who are, are, are just the oligarchy, right? That that rule the world. Um, they're they're in touch with demons, of course, right? They think they're. They, all they think, yeah. The, the, God, that. God is allowing it, and Satan is above them, right? But God is God is overall, right? But um, they are. Um, what are they driven by? They're driven, They have an insatiable desire for power. And that's what hell. Hell is a hell is a reverse hierarchy, right? Of people of beings that are devouring other beings to give themselves more and more power. Right? It's, ins it's insatiable, right? Once once a person uh, if a person becomes addicted to power, he can never have enough. Right? It's just insatiable. Uh, so so we might think that the Rockefellers, the Rothschilds are having a great life and they're just sitting around smoking cigars and having a great time while we suffer. No, they're tormented, right? Because they, they can never satisfy their masters, the demons, who are constantly egging them on to, to, do, to create more and more evil. Stalin was the, 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 the demon. Oh, Stalin definitely had a demon. There's a great portrayal. If you want to read it. Only, well, no, a legion, obviously. Stalin had a legion of demons. <laughs> but it, it, his own. Well, all these revolutionaries, they're all just, you can look at their faces, you know, they're just demonized. Right, they're just they, they can't rest. Stalin would stay up all night, and finally, there's a great part in in Solzhenitsyn's novel *In the First Circle*. It's mm -hmm. it's this great uh, fictional portrayal of Stalin, and uh, how he would just stay up all night and and be obsessed by the idea that somebody was going to kill him, and and uh, 
He 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 tried. He yeah. He was. He thought he could kill everybody before they killed him, but he died anyway. Yeah. You think the doctors killed him? That's that's the theory. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, what you're saying is very interesting. I'm uh, thinking of, uh, you know, this young generation is populated by all these superpower figures right now. Ah, everything. All the superpower Every, figures. Yes. Everything. It's, it's right. unbelievable. Okay. You can't read a book now that's separated. Everything is dominant. Well, they've been making movies for adults. The the, the adults going to see movies that are based on these comic books, right, of these Superpower figures. Yeah, everything. Right? Yeah. And, Super woman. And it's constant. Woman. Yes, and it, of course, there's a degradation of women. Yeah. Right? And men hitting women, right? Women yeah. fighting with men. men. Yes. But and this is possible because you don't do it in reality, you do it in the virtual world. So in the virtual world, it can be anything. Yeah, yeah. so people say, well, it's not real. It's, not it's, but it, but no it, consequences. But it affects your soul. I mean, to yeah. see these images, and these images are demonic, and you don't know what kind of subliminal programming is going on. No. Besides yeah. the obvious violence and the obvious demonic imagery, you don't know what, what kind of hundreds or thousands of subliminal messages they're giving through the... So, so all these movies and all of modern popular culture like rock concerts or even these giant professional or big-time college sporting events, these are, these are initiations into the demonic, right? They're, 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 they're like the, the big sporting arena. This, this is, this is a, 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 a Dionysian or a, a Bacchanalian initiation in, into a pseudo-transcendence of emotion, that you're, you're, you're bound all these other people in this pseudo-transcendence, where you're shouting and screaming and your team is winning or you're crying because they're losing. And it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way of um, giving people a substitute for religion. It's a substitute for faith, right? By, a pseudo, by the, this intense experience. It's a very intense, it's a very, uh, very well done Right, very, very professionally, very carefully crafted, done, uh, intentional initiation experience into a form of a demonic form of transcendence, so that people are receiving just by going to the movies or going to games or whatever. They're receiving a demonic initiation. They don't even, they don't even realize it. And of course, if they hear me say that, they think I'm crazy. Right, they, they think I'm overreacting. But but we know we're not crazy because we know we have the Holy Fathers to teach us about the meaning of certain symbols or the meaning of certain rituals or how our souls should feel at certain times. And that when our soul feels a certain way, that that's a warning sign, right? That that's not, not normal, that that's not right. Okay? So we, we know from the experience of the Holy Fathers of countless saints, and they tell us and we know how to, how to sort through all this. Um, Boy Scouts, I mean, Pardon me? The Boy Scouts. Well, of course the Boy Scouts, right? And this is why if Orthodox, com Orthodox communities who are serious had their own scouting programs, that did not involve occult rituals. They were carefully supervised. For example, in the Russian Church abroad, we used to have uh, the Russian Pathfinders or Russian Scouts. And the Russian Scouts, the origin of that was that white army officers had training programs for young men to teach them Orthodox faith, uh, personal discipline, military style discipline and skills, survival skills and patriotism. And, uh, and so the, the, an Orthodox program, especially young men, need these kinds of, young men need training. See? And the Orthodox, unfortunately, the Orthodox communities have abandoned their young men to be just trained by you-know-who, or trained by whoever, right? The Boy Scouts, uh, sports, blah, blah, blah. But no, young men need training. They need, young men need uh, physical training, the discipline of physical hardiness, right? Um, survival skills. And, uh, and they need to be taught that they are leaders in, in their church and in patriotism. They can't be a leader anymore because all these uh, relationships they have with the society now, you have to be quiet and not to show your manly, not to show your manly traits. Yeah, because yeah, because uh, cause of feminism. Yeah, you're exactly. a, feminism yeah. to make us uh, new, new, neuter. Yeah, but neuter. see, but that's why in the church we have to have our own um, institutions and our own programs so that we're not limited by that. And um, so in the Russian scouts, uh, they would get up, they'd have prayers, uh, they wore a uniform. That was actually the, the little badge of things were all modeled on old czarist or white army 
um, insignia, things like that. They're all or from Tsarist times, right? And um, and they would raise the the American flag and the old Russian flag, and sing the uh, "God Save the Tsar" uh, the uh, the Russian the old Russian anthem, right? And then they'd have breakfast, and they they'd go through a like a military style day where they had they had different exercises they were doing they, and different skills they were learning, building fires and hunting hunting down people in the woods, you know, and surviving in the woods and things like that, and also of course cleaning their cabins and and being disciplined, right? And of course in the evening they'd have prayers and have catechism, and the bishop and the priests would always be involved, right? So this is we need this, and um, all the Orthodox uh, groups should have. Uh, programs like this, and especially, I know they're all co-ed now, but especially these have to be emphasized for the young men, and, and that the young men have to be leaders, because the, the, who's going to protect, ultimately, who's going to protect the women and the children if the men are not leaders? You know, they have to be. So we have to work very hard on that. Um. <clears throat>